Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN Radio. We want you to know you can find our show on all the podcast apps, too. And if you want to see see us, uh, you can go to Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel and view us there and subscribe there. And we appreciate all, all our viewers uh, on, on YouTube. Today, it's a beautiful day in Waikiki Beach. We've had a week of surf that uh, was as big as it gets in Hawaii, in Waikiki. We had some 35-foot-plus faces out here. I'm looking out at the ocean right now, and it's, it's just calm. It's, it's, it's the Pacific. That's what uh, the name Pacific means to be, uh, you know, very peaceful. <laughs> but not true of the Pacific. Just the first time one of the explorers found it, that's what he named it, was, was the Pacific. Cindy and I will go out and do a little bit of um, snorkeling today. Maybe we take our spears out. Maybe we can find some fish. After a big surf, it's tough because it stirs up a lot of uh, sand, and so maybe we don't know what the clarity or the visibility will be. But we'll be right back with more of the Bear Watson Convention. Our guest is going to be Dr. Bradley Gregory. We'll talk story about the Old Testament. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, life is a journey. We were, Cindy and I have been watching uh, a, a, a reality show called, uh, I, I don't know, it was one of the adventure the adventure um, races in Fiji with uh, Bear Grylls this last week. We just got hooked on it. And it's, you know, you have all these different teams and they're helping each other over, I mean, so extreme. I think Cindy and I have done each of those elements of the adventure, but we've never done them all over a 700-kilometer tra- race <laughs> in such rugged terrain. Um, and so you, you have the ups and your downs, but through it all, there's kind of a team there with you, and, and no one is, gets left behind. If someone gets injured, the whole team stops and takes care of them. In a way, that's what the Old Testament is. It's a journey uh, uh, through time with uh, through a very a very adventurous course. Adventure, Louis L'Amour, one of my favorite authors, says, is just another way of saying, another way of saying having a really tough go when you're uh, when you're when you're on a journey but we, but the old testament is like that we have we see all these different types of teams these different types of characters that come into play and they're far from perfect and yet somehow god sees in them uh, a heart uh that that he can uh that he can have a relationship with and and through through uh the experience the pedagogy the journey the adventure the adventure race uh he transforms those people into the man of God. You know, David was a murderer. Uh, Moses was a murderer for that, for that matter, too. But somehow uh, in, his, uh, in God's mercy, he was able to take people that were on, on, uh, on, a, on an extreme adventure and, and transform their hearts into being the hearts of gold. And that's why we love the Old Testament, because it's, it's so full of so many gory and so many interesting stories. I mean, actually, have to be R-rated, I think, if, if they really showed it the way it was. That's why we have with us today. This is why when I met Dr. Bradley G- Gregory uh, at the OSV Talks in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, we were each going to be, we were each doing OSV Talks, and we he, he said Old Testament. I just kind of gravitated to him. But if I told you his title, we can't fit it. Let's put it this way. We can't fit Bradley Gregory's title on our YouTube uh, title screen. It wouldn't fit. Associate Professor of Biblical Studies and Associate Dean for Graduate Studies at uh, Washington University. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gregory. Thanks for having me. Um, Yeah, it was great to meet you at at Fort Wayne. School of Theological and Religious Studies, expertise in deuterocanonicals. I guess that's in between um, the Maccabean area. Is that what that would be? Or when when would the deuterocanonicals? Yeah, around there. They're, they're basically the seven books that are in the Catholic Old Testament that yes. are not in the Jewish Bible or the Protestant Old Praise Testament. Praise God. Praise God for those. Yeah. Textual history of biblical literature, wisdom literature. Um, I think you skipped that, though, didn't you? You didn't learn how to apply it. I didn't learn how to apply what? The wisdom literature. Oh, I think it takes a <laughs> lifetime to apply that. <laughs> anyway, welcome so to the show. Working on- welcome to the show. Thanks. Glad. How was your experience at, at, at when we're recording the OSV talks? 
last last month? Uh, I I really enjoyed it. I mean, uh, Doug Tuke, who does a lot of the the video work there, had told me that most people find the best part just getting to know the other presenters. Um, and I found that to be true. There was a great sense of camaraderie, lots of interesting people doing interesting things. And, um, you know, it was a little, I guess, intimidating to get up and give the talk, uh, probably for all of us, but it was just a great experience. Uh, it, you see the church at its best at, at a, at a event like that. I think they were all, they, they were so professional, but you know, I've been, uh, I've been on, uh, the set of Hawaii five Oh, I have, I've had different parts here and there, but man, the way they set this thing up when you got there, they're like, okay, we've got over a million dollars worth of equipment here. you got 15 <laughs> minutes, no more than 15 minutes, no less than 15 minutes. This is where you're going to stand. You're not going to walk away from it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and if you make a mistake, you just got to keep on going. And, but don't feel any pressure. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and it was and well it maybe was. for you i when i started my i mean i you know i i speak publicly a bit i guess and when i started my talk uh i did i started the first sentence and a half and like the whole rest of my script just it fell away like it was me and then this this abyss of nothing <laughs> before me and I thought, okay, yeah, okay, I'll take a, I'll take that pause, I'll take that pause, I'll take that pause, and then finally, I just, I just told the audience, you know, every surfer has their wipeouts, and this is a wipeout <laughs> for me, and I had to start over. So I think I had the worst wipeout of all the OSV. Uh, but no broken bones, right? No, so. no, no, I didn't, I didn't pass out or anything, anyway. So, <laughs> but we're so glad, we're so glad that you're you're here, and we we I love reading the old, t I love r r reading Louis L'Amour westerns. And I love reading the Old Testament. So many of them, there's so so many are so much alike. You take a, a somewhat less than perfect person, and you see God work with them to grow in virtue. Why, why do you love the Old Testament? That's a good question. Um, I, I I got interested in the Old Testament really in college, and I think I was drawn to the earthiness of it, the the way the characters are really multidimensional. It has a kind of grand sweep to it. Probably also in college, uh, there was a part of it that it was, I guess you could say exotic, because most of my Christian friends really focused on the New Testament. Um, and so I, I guess it was a little bit um, out there to do that. It reminds me of when my oldest was about six or seven years old. He came down one morning and said, Dad, I have a confession to make. When one of your kids says, I have a confession to make, you're always bracing yourself. Yeah. And he said, I think I like the New Testament more than the Old Testament. And uh, yeah. so that's okay. So what a horrible every, kid. Most people do. <laughs> what a horrible kid. What a problem child that is. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, so talk, yeah. talk story with us about the Old Testament and, and how it came to be, because there was a time when there wasn't, I mean, you know, how did it come to, to be uh, passed down from generation to generation and how it came to be written? And talk story with us about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the great things about the Old Testament is, unlike the New Testament, which was written in a pretty narrow window of time, you know, over a few decades, uh, the Old Testament really came to be over a very long period, and not just because different books were written at different times, but you see in a lot of the books this kind of gradual growth. Um, and for some people, that's troubling, but for me, uh, it, it, it's a testimony to how God is at work in each generation. And each generation sees the stories of the past as relevant to them. And so they retell them in a way that that makes them relevant for their own day. It doesn't lose what was in the past, but it connects it. So the past, the present, the future are all connected by the same God who continues to work with every generation. Um, and so the Old Testament, really, you can almost kind of think of it as like this flowering reality over a long period of time and and what you get at the end is something that has a unifying thread through it but is wonderfully diverse all different kinds of literature lots of different kinds of people all encountering god all being used by god in different ways um and that really speaks to my life uh i think oftentimes you have to take take the long vision on things mm -hmm. um i'll tell you one of my favorite biblical characters is Leah in the book of Genesis. And one of the things I love about Leah is that uh, she, you know, she was the less loved wife of Jacob. Jacob preferred well, her sister he, Rachel. He, well, he was tricked into marrying her. Yeah, I mean, he didn't, she didn't, 
I mean, imagine going through your life thinking, I'm only with this guy because he was tricked. Well, he, for seven um, years he worked to marry Rachel, yeah. and then here's yeah. Leah in his nuptial bed. Do- Dr. Uh, Gregory, we got to take a quick break. So I want th- th- this is just delights me, this, this, that, you, that you, you would focus in on a story like this, but it's so typical of the Old Testament. Dr. Bradley Gregory, how can they find you if they want to find Do you want to be found? <laughs> yes. Okay, how uh, can they, they can find, find you? me at the, the Catholic University of America's website. Um, I'm in the School of Theology and Religious Studies, yeah. Catholic University. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite you to go to our Deep Adventure, Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. We have three years of my sitting in front, standing in front of the beach or wherever I was in the world, even in Ireland, all over the world, uh, teaching through the entire catechism, a little 10 to 15 minute segments that really kind of help bring the catechism to life. You can find that there. You can find uh, all of our Bear Wozniak Adventure radio shows and, and all kinds of fun stuff. In fact, our number two video that we have at the Bear Wozniak Adventure, uh, Deep, Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube is me tandem surfing with an Olympic pole vaulter. <laughs> I met her and I thought, I met her, met her before she was an Olympian. And I told her dad, this girl can jump really good because when you tandem surf, you have to lift the girl. I had to stop her from jumping too high. <laughs> but uh, we have all kinds of great videos there. But, but uh, go visit Bear Wozniak um, Deep Adventure YouTube channel and, and please subscribe. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is Daniel Boone Markham with another episode of Country Up. Shoot. A shoot is something folks today think of as plain old fun. You know, it's that tube you slide down with acceleration into a pool of warm water. But to a wagon master on the Oregon Trail, it meant nothing but toil, sweat, and swearing or praying dependent upon one's disposition. The near last shoot on the Oregon Trail is called the Laurel Hill Shoot where immigrants like my great-grandpa, Dan, wrestled with ropes, pulleys, and sheer strength to lower his wagon and oxen down a near-vertical rocky slope to the next section of the trail. Keep in mind, there were five chutes on the Laurel Grade, but the Laurel Hill chute was the worst of the bunch. I'm sure the only thing that kept great-grandpa and grandma going was the fact they had already come some 2,000 miles and only 50 more to go before reaching Oregon City, Oregon, the end of the trail. Their eyes were resolutely fixed on the final destination. The book of Hebrews was written to folks who were gravely struggling with their faith during a difficult time in their spiritual journey. The writer encouraged them with these words, "'Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles.'" And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Grab a rope and pull, my friends. Don't lose heart. Like Jesus, there's joy set before you too. This is Dan LeBoon Markham at CountryUp.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year School of Manliness. Video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments, help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our guest is Dr. Bradley Gregory, Associate Professor of Biblical Studies and Associate Dean for the gradu- for Graduate Studies at Washington University. Catholic University of America in Washington. Okay. So. I'm, I didn't write the part down. 
sorry, Catholic University. I'll ask you next time. Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. So, you know, the, the Old Testament is, like you said, it's a, it's a, it's a book of literature, psalms. Um, some are allegorical. Uh, some are historical. Some are chronological, like almost the, like the way a king would take notes to, find, to re recall what, was in, what happened in his time as a, in, as a king. And, and, uh, and, and what's so interesting is Augustine, you know, when he wanted, he began to take seriously, should I study this, this, this Christian religion? He thought it was going to be laid out like, like, uh, like Plato. Or, or like uh, the, the, the great philosophers of his time, and, or the Stoics or whatever. And then he just saw, this is just a bunch of books. How can you make any sense out of this? You know? so, so it does take someone to make sense out of it. Uh, and that's why the church that canonized that library of books called the Bible um, is the best place to go to find, out, uh, to find out the truth of Scripture. And so we have Dr. Bradley Gregory from Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. So... Talk about we were, we were talking about Leah. How do you say it, Leah or Leah? How do you? What's the right? right you can say it either way. Yeah, I say Leah, but um, yeah. I, so I was before our break. I was talking about um, you know she lived a life of suffering and insignificance, and she always wanted Jacob to love her, and he never did. Um, but there are two things I think about Leah that are encouraging to me. One is that. Um, of her six chill of her six sons and then she also had uh dinah um two of them were judah and levi so there's no way leah could have ever known this but although she was unloved by her husband uh it would be from her that the kings and priests of israel would come and uh you know sometimes in our lives we never see the long game of what god's going to do um and it can feel like we're insignificant, but God can do with, uh, with our lives more than we can see. And then the other thing about Leah that, um, that I find encouraging is that when her sister Rachel dies, they're on the way somewhere, and she's just buried along the side of the road. Um, and then Leah lives with Jacob for, for a while longer. But when Leah dies, she's buried in the cave of Machpelah which is where Abraham and Sarah are buried, and it's where mm -hmm. Isaac and Rebecca are buried, and it's where Jacob is gonna be buried as well. So she ends up in the, in the, the cave of the patriarchs and matriarchs. And mm. so that, and then, you know, the kings and, and priests of Israel come from her. And none of those things she could see in her lifetime, but, but God was doing something with her. And I just find that tremendously encouraging but also really true to life because oftentimes you know life doesn't feel like a fairy tale uh, mm. but god can use whatever's happening in it your feels life. like that adventure race in fiji when you're you're going down the rapids and and the next thing isn't rapids it's a waterfall <laughs> you, know, <and> you wonder <laughs> and you, and you yeah. think god what are you doing wrong you know what what did you do wrong what where did you go off the the chart but then you just see, you look back on your life and you can see in your own life this beautiful tapestry of why sometimes God said no. Why sometimes you had detours in your life you didn't expect. And they always say it, the adventure begins at the detour. Abraham had his detour. You know, he was, he was in, the, in Ur of the Chaldees and then God said, no, nah, I want you to go over here to the land I will show you. He had to follow. He had to every day just walk along. God would show him. He didn't say, I want you to go here to this place and do this. He said, just walk along with me. And I'll show you this land. The other thing is, I don't think Abraham owned any land except for that place that he bought. He was a sojourner, right? Yeah. And as the, soon the, as he the, gets the there. The funeral place that he bought, the, the, the cave. Oh, right. Yeah, that's the only land he ever bought was the place for the cave um, to, to bury uh, Sarah. Um, so he was a yeah, sojourner. The, I, he was a sojourner like we all are. He was. And it's, it's ironic that even after he travels all that way and gets to the promised land, almost immediately famine hits and he has to go to Egypt where then of course Pharaoh takes his wife. And I mean, isn't that well, so well, true well, to life? Mean, dude, I mean, the guy goes, just tell him you're my sister. <laughs> this is our <laughs> courageous patriarch Abraham, right? Well, actually, so it's interesting because probably what was happening there, we know this from the way uh, other documents in the ancient world uh, tell us these things worked. Probably what Abraham thought he was going to do was in the absence of a woman's father, if he's not there, the brother gets to negotiate the bride price. And in the ancient Near East, uh, 
this sounds odd to us, but um, siblings were particularly valued because like you can replace a spouse, replace a spouse if they die. You can never replace a brother. And so Abraham was safer as her brother because they wouldn't bereave her of an irreplaceable brother like they could a husband. So Abraham probably thought I can keep us both safe. And as the negotiator of a bride price, I can just make it so high, nobody will marry her. But what Abraham didn't count on was that she would catch the eye of Pharaoh. And, you know, it's a, I think it's a case of the of best the laid. Fa- of the Pharaoh. Yeah. Right. Of the Pharaoh. The, uh, right. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a case of, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's true to life as well. Right. I mean, he gets in these situations and we often try to make the best of what we're handed, but we never can really predict what's going to happen. And that's where faith comes in. Um, mm-hmm. You have to kind of ride it out. You got to make a stand. Yeah. But sometimes prudence isn't being clever. Prudence is, is, is a different thing. It's being wise. It's seeking the true good in every situation. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure about if I question his, what, what do I know about it? Did, didn't he do that twice or was there another patriarch that, that did the same thing? I'm trying to remember now. So he did it twice, uh, and then uh, Isaac did it once. So like, well. kind of like father, like uh, son. <laughs> yeah, I guess it was a thing. <laughs> Jeez, but we love we love the Old Testament. But how do how were these stories passed down? You know, in Hawaii we have the tradition of the of the hula, and the ancient hula, the kahuku hula, is all passing down history, and also mm-hmm. passing down. Um, uh, fighting for the men, it's it's a fighting. It, it's it's the lua, the fighting art of the men. How they passed it down. It's like the martial arts when you do katas and things. But we, the Hawaiians, passed down their oral, oral tradition through the hula and the melee. How did these stories get handed down from the like from the yeah, very be be, more, from their beginning it, from Genesis? Yeah, it it'd be more like the Hawaiian model than the typical American model. You know, very few people were literate. It was pretty much the the priest and the people associated with the royal house who could read and write. So a lot of these things, they're told communally um, and they are part of the people's identity. And, you know, there's this uh, great passage in Deuteronomy where he says, um, you know, in the future, your sons and your son's sons are going to ask you, why do we do this? Why do we do that? And this is what you tell them. And then it's the story of the Exodus, right? So, it's passing from one generation to the other, preserving what God has done and then adding to it. Um, so they were a primarily oral culture um, to the degree that they had written down text. They were to serve as kind of like prompts for this. Mm-hmm. But this is not, you know, the Old Testament wasn't the kind of thing people just go sit in their closet and kind of just read for private use. These are texts that bring the whole community of faith together to worship the God who continues to work with them every generation. And then it's the the priests and the scribes who are associated with the temple and the royal palace who copy these down. Uh, a scroll would have lasted about 20 to 30 years. So at least that often you'd have to recopy it and recopy mm. it. Um, and these have been kept like in the archives, but they are they are in a sense the property of Israel. You know, there's not a copyright for the particular author. On and it, it was right? it was Moses. It is said that actually wrote down the the first five books of the Bible that had it written down, changed from oral to written. Or tell me about that. Is that am I not getting it quite so right? So that that yeah, that's a very old tradition. The 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 Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, they never actually claim Moses wrote them. Um, probably what we have is we have a, a tradition that goes back to. Um, some figure Moses, but that was crafted and recrafted over a long period of time. Um, So they tended to think, we tend to think of authors as like the person who wrote it down and put a copyright on it. Um, In the ancient world, they tended to think of people more as like the fountainhead of tradition. Mm -hmm. And when people wrote that down, they were just writing down what what all goes back to that kind of seminal figure. To what there. to what degree do you think, like in the Hawaiian tradition, they actually memorized uh, the words more than paraphrased the words? Uh, for many people, it would have been a, a great deal of memorization. Mm-hmm. Um, there are there are Jewish scholars today who memorize 
the entire Pentateuch or the whole well, Psalms I, and stuff. I can just see, you know, and we have to got to take a break here, but I can just see you're sitting around the campfire, your iPad's got no good sight, you know, good coverage, you know, and uh, you got nothing to do. So David gets his harp out and he sings some of the Psalms. And that's good. You begin to memorize the songs and. And then the oral traditions are kind of like that's the talking story. That that's that's what was that was the entertainment and to a great extent also was just tell us another story. Tell us about Joe Jacob. Tell us about Leah. We're talking with Dr. Bradley Gregory. He's from the. Can you tell me the official? I always get that university's name mixed up. Catholic University of America. It's a Catholic University of America in Washington D.C. Uh, and uh, he is the associate professor of biblical studies, associate dean of, for graduate studies. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Aloha and welcome to a deep adventure moment. This is. Bear Wozniak coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach. You know, when you paddle out in big waves, and I remember a big day surfing Rincon, it was such a big day that the pier at Mentura was basically destroyed. Boulders were being knocked about, and I paddled out and paddled out and paddled out, and then finally, it was like, after 45 minutes, I couldn't get out, and then the cleanup set came and just drove me back towards the shore and threw me basically halfway up on the roadside of Pacific Coast Highway. There's a saying that the monks of the desert had, and that is, memore morte, remember your death. They took that from the Roman tradition. When a general would go and win a great victory, they would allow him to come to Rome, leave his army north of the Rubicon, but he would come into the city of Rome and they would throw a great triumph for him. And they would be acclaiming him and telling him how great he is. But just two paces behind them would be a slave or a servant saying, Memore morte, memore morte. What does that mean? Remember your death, you're only mortal. The monks of the desert would live all by themselves and they would seek to go deeper with God and they would pray the Psalms. Maybe they would have a hold of one gospel that they could read, but almost all of them had a skull in their little cave and when they got together they may have mass or something like that they wouldn't speak at all to each other except to say the words memore morte remember your death we need to live our lives as if we're going to die when we celebrate the feasts of the saints we don't celebrate their their biological birth we celebrate their death we celebrate their biological birth into heaven we need to live every day remembering our death and longing for the beatific vision this is bear wasnick from deepadventure.com you can gain traction in the virtues in my book Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak deepadventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too. Plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you wanna find the perfect gift. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Dudes, we've been working so hard on our TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. You know, we have EWTN, I think, is airing us on Tuesday evenings. Uh, and, of course, you can go to the Bear Wozniak, uh, to the deepadventure.com website, and you, be, and you can become a, a member there, either of the, the Bear School of Manliness or the Mama Bears. And you can have access to all of our TV shows and all of our radio shows right there on that website so you've got 23 episodes that you can uh, women you can kind of put on on the tv because it's a youtube version of the show and sneakily have your brother-in-law watch it and 
become a Catholic convert. It's not an, it's not an unusual story for uh, for us to see that happen. So the, the we have one episode for free on YouTube. The rest are private, but you can get them through our website. You can also uh, subscribe. You can also see them on I'm on Prime Video. We're currently working on about 15 episodes that we filmed here in Hawaii, and then we have about another six or seven that we filmed in the Upper Peninsula. And it's so cool how the Holy Spirit led us to go out, get all this all this um, all of the uh, uh, filming done before COVID hit, uh, because after that, our team of writers, you know, broke up, went different directions in our, our film crew. So we have all this in the can and we're working on it now. We ask you to pray for us to really bring forth the gospel, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in Long Ride Home. So check us out. Go to deepadventure.com. We're talking with Dr. Bradley Gregory. Okay. American. Okay. What is, how do you say it again? I always forget the name of the Catholic uh, University of America. Gosh, I feel so ignorant. I like, like um, that everyone's gonna say, "Why does he have a radio show?" But yeah, I, I, I just I always get that one that mixed up. But he's the professor of biblical studies and really an expert in, in the Old Testament. So, Brad, in the in the in the in the days when, uh, in the primitive, actually during the time of King David, there was the practice of getting up at different uh, at to stopping at the different uh, at certain hours during the day and in the evening, to pray. And uh, that was carried on through through the centuries into the New Testament to where the Jews at cer- certain villages or cities, any town of a certain size, uh, the Romans would ring bells at certain hours. And so the, the, the Jewish people in the diaspora and in, in Jerusalem, they would stop at these hours and they would pray. Uh, and and quite often it was the Psalms. And then when you see in the, in the New Testament, you see the tradition of the early church did that same practice. And in time, the monks of the desert took that practice of, of some would recite the Psalms in one week, some in, in three months, but um, they would pray the Psalms and they would, they would pray the scripture back to the Lord. And then uh, St. Benedict kind of, kind of formalized that. And as, as a Benedictine oblate, and well, my father actually introduced me to the practice of praying the liturgy of the hour, he was, became a Catholic deacon. But the liturgy of the hour, then there's certain hours during the day when we stop and pray, but all through that liturgy of the hour, we're praying the Psalms, and I know that you have a particular love for the Psalms, and they're such an integral part. If you make the Psalms a part of your life, it can be a great ascent, and it can be a journey upwards. Uh, to pray back to God, His words is a powerful way, and that's what your book, what, was, what is the title of the, the new book? The Theology and Spirituality of the Psalms of Ascents. The Psalm of Ascents. So can you yeah. tell us what in the world that means? Yeah, so the, the, these are a group of 15 psalms. They're from Psalm 120 to 134, and uh, they're very short. They're some of the shorter psalms in the book, and they were probably used by people as they made pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and um, they have a kind of certain cadence to it. They they kind of breathe the air of pilgrimage and journey, um, and so I, I decided to write this book because I really wanted to delve in and and make accessible to other people um, the spiritual dynamics of a pilgrimage or a journey um, that even though we don't you know still travel to jerusalem three times a year for pilgrimage festivals there's something to that that's that's part of the christian life the christian life is a a long journey to the presence of god and uh so that's really what the book is is getting into those psalms and drawing out the theology and spirituality that's animating them and then trying to the last chapter kind of positions it in christian theology with the eucharist and that kind of thing do you have a book of psalms handy where we could you could read one of those to us well I, oh, I'll, sure. I'll talk story for a moment you know whenever you read in scripture they don't say we're going to go go to jerusalem they say we're going to go up to jerusalem it's always an ascent um, right. if, if you've been there you know you know that it is that whether you're east north west or south Going to Jerusalem is always going up to Jerusalem, and that's part of our, our spiritual heritage is to to um, to uh, go to Mount Zion. To uh, is Mount Zion on the side of the north, the city of the great king? Uh, let's go yeah. visit Jesus. Tell, that's tell right. Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, there are some of the Psalms of Ascent that, that are some of the most famous Psalms that people uh, may just not have realized that they were a, a Psalm of Ascent. So Psalm 130, Out of the Depths I Cried, uh, often known by its Latin title, De Profundis, um, which shows up in culture all over the place. That's one of the Psalms of Ascents. 
Um, Psalm 121 is, is another famous one. I raise my eyes toward the mountains from where shall come my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Um, so it has, uh, it has these uh, kind of cadences about what it means to live the spiritual life. And what's remarkable about the Psalms of Ascent is how much they show an awareness of conflict and hostility and danger and threat. Mm. We like to think of pilgrimage as just, oh, you take a nice you know, road trip to Jerusalem. Um, but trips in the ancient world could be dangerous and, um, and you didn't always quite know where you were going. And so the journey itself was part of growth and faith. It wasn't, mm. they didn't have this sense that the journey was just something you do so you can have the spiritual experience when you get to Jerusalem. The journey itself is part of the spiritual formation. Um, and you really get that in the Psalms of a sense that um, there's a whole process that happens to you as you journey to Jerusalem. And then as you go back home, God's presence goes with you and it, it enriches your everyday life. Um, so God isn't just over there and you can go see him, but then you leave him. Um, God, in a sense, pilgrimages with his people. Mm. And that that's, goes back to what we were saying about the Old Testament, that it's a journey. It's an adventure race. I mean, I, I think I think anyone who's been on a Catholic pilgrimage knows that it's a bit of an expedition more than a joy ride. I mean, especially when there's no bathroom on the bus, uh, it can be challenging. <laughs> but, but 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 it's nothing like what it was for the pilgrims. But the thing about the Catholic Church and our faith is that we uh, we journey with the Lord, but we journey with each other. There's a companion. Jesus sent them out by in twos when he sent them out to evangelize. That there's coming the way we come alongside each other and journey with each other. And people out there that are lone rangers, you know, in America there's such a society of just, you know, I did it my way, which is probably the worst song ever written. Uh, um, no, lone rangers get lone rangers. Uh, the lone wolves get picked off. I used to have a, Mont uh, a cabin in Montana. I didn't have a cabin. I had land, and then I built my own little cabin with my own little hands. Didn't know what I was doing, but the first time I went to my land, uh, Brad, I saw, and this is way up two miles from Canada, right across from Glacier Park, right across the, mm. the North Fork of the Flat Head River, two two miles, no, less than two miles to Glacier. Um, the first time I walked onto my land because I didn't even have a road, I saw a lone wolf, and uh, it, it's it was fierce looking it was had these green fluorescent eyes it, i mean it's hard to say but it seemed like they were green and fluorescent and he was angry because he was uh kicked out of the, he used to be the alpha male he was kicked out of his pack and now i'm on his land you know but but uh but there there is there's a certain um there's a certain uh danger when you're a lone wolf that lone wolf is someone who's been kicked out of the pack and if you think you're some tough guy who doesn't need to be going to church or be fellowshipping with other with other men then you're mistaken you're the one that's going to starve to death that lone wolf was mad because he was hungry he didn't get to eat what the pack brought down maybe he got to eat the leftovers so if you're a lone wolf out there you need to go 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 to church find a men's group uh, talk to your priest about that um, join knights of columbus or something but you have to be in the company of other men just like in the ancient of days when they walked together the journey was always done with other people by your side yeah in in days cartus s pope benedict the 16th has a a great observation which he says the eucharist not only unites us to christ but in united us to christ that unites us to each other um so it's not like we all just come individually to the table and then leave but we're knit together as the body of Christ by this sacramental life. And that's part of what it means to be united to Christ, and we're is one, to be part of his whole body. We're one, we're one loaf. And again, you go back to that, the, the, the Psalms of Ascent, that is the Ascent. The Eucharist is, as we say, the summit of our faith. And we're called to come together to receive that Eucharist. And uh, mm -hmm. if you're part of the body of Christ, then look around you, because that's the rest of your body over there. And, and you know you don't want to reject your finger or your hand. and and you can't, if all you are is an ear, you're not going to do very well as a human being. You need to be part of the body of Christ. So you you lone rangers out there, you tough guys, you lone wolves out there, and I know who you are because I was one of them, find other men. And if you can't find them, go to deepadventure.com because right there we have uh, 
the man cave and we have Bear School of Manliness and we get together on Zoom calls and we share and encourage one another. That's at deepadventure.com. We're talking with Dr. Bradley Gregory, PhD at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Did I get it right? And where can they find you if they, if they want to find you? They can go to the Catholic University uh, School of Theology website and, and I'm on there. That's what I did. Yeah. That's how I got all your, that's how I got all your bio and the bio (laughs) goes on forever. So it's longer than Augustine's writings back here. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. We invite our mama bears to join our non-Facebook community created just for you, to share the journey with each other and to take the self-guided one-year course on the Virtues Plus, you have free access to all of the Long Ride Home TV show, all of the Bear Wozniak video version of our radio show, plus the Catechism in a Year videos, all at deepadventure.com. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to say aloha to all you mama bears. You know, my new book, 12 Rules of Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? Don't, it's not out yet. I'm working on it. Please pray for me to do a halfway decent job on it. But I, I, I'm writing it based on this love I have for Louis Lamour, this great Western author. I think anyone out there that has sons, uh, you know, seven or eight years old, 10 years old or older, they should all read every one of his 100 books. I think there's such a great call to, to manly virtue. But one of the things about all these books is Louis L'Amour is one of the first men to really have valiant women, strong women all, uh, in his books. Every book, in every book, there is a strong, valiant woman uh, as, one, as one of the main characters. Often that woman found herself in a vulnerable position because she was... Uh, you know, there was, you know, uh, people stronger than her, uh, you know, bad guys, a gang or someone. And it took a, a valiant man to step in between uh, her uh, and and this and protect her. But nevertheless, she was a fierce, fiercely strong woman. And that's why we love our mama bears. These are the women. So many of you, you you're like kindling. You, you give your life to the Lord so easily. You start on fire so easily. But you're the kindling for that big piece of oak to start on fire. And it takes a while longer for that man to really warm up to the Lord. But continue in your kindling prayers. Pray for them. And when that man begins to have a fire for the Lord, no fire bill to put it out. And so your kuleana, your job is to continue what you're doing. But you can find some encouragement if you go to deepadventure.com and uh, become part of our mama bears. We'd love to have you there. There's nothing more fierce than a mama bear, Brad. When I had my cabin in Montana, the Grizzlies, I came across mama bears twice. And there's, uh, there, you know, there's nothing like mama bears. So we have with us today Dr. Bradley Gregory. He is with Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Uh, and um, his, 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 his title is too long to read, but he's a professor of biblical studies and loves the Old Testament. So we were talking about the Psalms of Ascent. Uh, what Psalms are those again? 120 to 134. 120 to 134. And what else can we, can we uh, learn from those Psalms? Yeah, I think um, maybe t- people today, when we think about spirituality, our relationship with God, we primarily think of it as an internal matter. Um, but in ancient Israel, and you really see these in the Psalms, um, they thought that space and time can be sacred as well. So time, you have the Sabbath and the sabbatical years and the Jubilee and so forth. Space in Jerusalem, God is present in a way he's not anywhere else. And so the whole rhythm of their life was structured by sacred space and time. Hmm. And um, I think that we could learn a lot from that, um, just even in, say, adoration or approaching the Eucharist. Um, It's amazing that we have access to the most sacred space and time at mass, no matter where you are, right? 
Um, I, I've often, I, I mentioned this in my, my book on the Psalms, that if you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, um, what makes that, you, you wait in line and you go into the Eticule, which is where Jesus was thought to have been laid um, after he died. And what makes that so holy is the opposite of what makes most holy sites holy. It's what's not there. It's mm. that Jesus is risen. Mm. Most holy sites, it's because that's where the saint is buried, or that's where a relic is, or something like that. But Jesus is risen, and then because of that, and because we encounter him in the Eucharist, um, sacred space, sacred time are available, whoever, wherever, whenever we go to to worship Christ and the Mass. Um and so I think recovering that dimension that Israel was really attuned to, but then realizing how Christ has kind of exploded those categories um, in a way that we often, we just don't appreciate. We just think, oh, I'm going to get up and go to church, and should I take communion this week or not? Let me think, have I gone to confession and so forth? Um, but I think recovering that sense of awe and wonder at, at the mystery of what the Eucharist is, I think is something that really comes out of the theology of the Psalms of Ascent nicely. You know, my mother came to become Catholic when she was going through a hard time as a child, really mm. tough times. Her mother died in childbirth and other t tough things happened to her. So when she was just a young girl, probably in her, around 10 years old, even though she was Lutheran, she found she could go into the Catholic church during the day. And she j that became her, her place of peace and wonder and awe, and she didn't understand why until later she found out it was the presence of the of the Eucharist in the in the tabernacle and so when we're when we do that song of ascent when we're when we're there in Eucharistic adoration we're at that sacred place we're at that tomb where we're, that where Jesus rose again our Catholic faith is so profound you know going back to the Old Testament um, so different the Old Testament is so different from any other of the pagan religions you know from the very beginning in the beginning God so they, they speak of one God, mm -hmm. uh, the God who created the universe out of nothing. You know, he just spoke a word. Wow. I mean, t talk about, I know you love Genesis also. What is the difference between the Jewish faith, that faith of Genesis 1, that there, there was one God, not a pantheon, not a soap opera of gods, not a God to necessarily be appeased, more a God to be pleased, what what do you see there in Genesis that what is what made the Jewish people that well they the, going back to Adam and Eve before there was the Hebrew nation? What's that that Old Testament is so unique compared to any other pagan religion? Yeah, I mean you've you've hit upon maybe the biggest one, which is uh, in Judaism you have one God, not a pantheon of gods. But if you look at other creation accounts in the the ancient world. Uh, Part of that also is that in most creation accounts, you have all these gods, and it's through their battles, their fighting, and the bloodshed that the world is made. So the world is made from the you know parts of slain gods. Whereas in Genesis, it's fiat. God simply speaks, and it comes to be. And uh, and you see that ripple all the way through. The creation story so in for example a mesopotamian creation story you have this battle of the gods some are slain and one of the the evil gods king U, uh, his blood is mixed with clay and that's humans are made out of that to be slaves of the gods and so humans are more expendable but they also look around and they say the thing that's wrong with human nature is because we're we're product of of a slain rebellious god but in Genesis, the world is created good and harmonious, and humans were created in the image of God to be in fellowship with God, not because the gods want someone to bring them food. So there's a kind of dignity, not just to people of your own ethnicity like in Israel, but all human beings are created with a dignity that comes from being in the image of God. And we take that for granted because in Western civilization, we're at the end of a long uh, history of Judaism and Christianity influencing it. But in the ancient world, that was radical. So different, the, yeah. 
the the battle of the gods you're made to be expendable to serve the gods that was the normal view that seems weird to us but that was normal to them and and and, the, and there were not just the pantheon of gods but there were often so many there was a household god for every little thing in your house you know um mm -hmm. and yet here here's here's this beautiful dignity that god gave man when he he made man out of mud but then he breathed into him and he became a living soul so that he could have communion with god yeah uh, one, one maybe just tangential thought. There's a great story in the ancient Jewish Midrash where someone asked, why did God take Eve out of Adam? Why didn't he just create a man and create a woman? And the rabbi answers, because by bringing the whole world from one man, when you kill a person, you destroy a world. When you save a person, you create a world um, in the kind of uh, image of what God does. It, it's a way of expressing the kind of profound dignity that God takes one person and from them brings the whole family of humanity. And, and going back to Leah, the, the legacy of this one woman rejected by her husband, who the tribe of the Levite and the tri tribe of tribe of Judah came from. I think when when when. Uh, when Cain killed Abel, uh, God's word were his bloods cry out to me. In other words, yeah. it's not just him, but his whole world that should have followed with him. And that, that goes back to this brief moment, if I'm going to just make this point, of abortion. That, that one, that child that you killed, you're not just killing that child, you're killing their whole, their whole, the generations that were to follow. We're talking with Dr. Bradley Gregory. Dude, we could have had a much longer conversation. We've got to draw this to an end. Where can people find you? At the School of Theology website at, on the Catholic University of America's webpage is the easiest place to find me. And you can find my, my new books. Oh, where can they find your book? It's Paulist Press. Is it, when is it coming out? Uh, it's set to be released in early October from Paulist Press, but you can get it on Amazon and all those places as well. And i got to mention my books, too, because Sophia won't be happy if I don't. But there's a— Yeah, a, go for it. The— uh, what is the name of the book? Uh, a Surfer's Guide to the Soul, and there's Deep Adventure, the Way of Heroic Virtue, and we just love Sophia. So here we have the tradition of, speaking of God giving breath, aloha, ha means breath, aloha means to give breath. We also use it for the word love. So we have the tradition of try, signing off with saying aloha. Uh, just as Jesus breathed his spirit, God the Father, and God breathed his spirit into man. So till next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha! Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak DeepAdventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift.